the outside one, and the lights were off. Some of the guys doing work at the house had decided to unplug the timer, and so the lights were off, and it made me think about the fact that Christmas is over, and lots of people are in a real hurry uh, to be sure that it's over and done. Uh, we were shopping, doing a little pre-Christmas shopping the other day uh, at a very high and mighty store called Target, and uh, as I was standing there near the coffee counter and all, uh, a couple of people were talking, and they were both employees, and they said something. I know you may think this is apocryphal, so you can take it for whatever it's worth, uh, but what the one employee said to the other is, Christmas is over, and the new year is coming, so what? Um, the truth is, what she said was, Christmas is over, thank God, and the new year is coming, so what? Interesting, isn't it? We have gone through a whole lot of celebrating and a whole lot of emphasizing very special themes and trying to lift up some of what we believe to be the heart of Christmas, but it's done. And here comes this chance that God gives each one of us for a brand new year. So what? What difference does it make? Is it just one more little slice of life and time? Or shall we do something with it? It's always the same challenge, but the truth is not what the challenge is, but how we respond to it. And so as we take a look at it, Christmas is over and so what and all that jazz, may I make this suggestion that you move toward and try to seek and find that star which moves your life. Right now, in the ancient world, the wise men were in motion somewhere or the other coming from a number of different places on camel pack. In fact, Michelle pointed out that the wise men shouldn't be here yet. See, Jesus is here and she said, what are the wise men doing there? And I said, riding toward Jesus on their camels. And uh, the uh, Greek church, many of you know this, the Greek Orthodox church will celebrate Christmas on Epiphany, the day that the wise men come. Why? Because they bring their gifts. And that's the gift giving time. And so that's a nice tradition as well. But the wise men need to be commended for two things. First of all, they had a vision. There was something they wanted. There was something that they needed. There was something that they thought would be important to their lives and they went for it, had a vision and went for it, and kept on going toward it. And I would imagine it wasn't an easy journey. And so it comes to you and to me to say just exactly what is your vision, what is your hope for your life in this next year? Everybody's going to make a bunch of resolutions. It usually takes us about 30 minutes to break them. <laughs> what I would suggest that you do is that you make one resolution that you choose to keep. I'm married to a wonderful woman who makes lists of things to do, uh, and she will make a list for things to do in one day that no mortal human being could do. <laughs> and then at the end of the day and say, oh, I didn't get it all done. Look out for that kind of thing. She and I have kidded about that back and forth for a long time. Make a resolution that you intend to deal with. Don't sit there shooting your fat mouth off, writing down a bunch of stuff that you have no intention of dealing with and that you're not going to do anything about it. Sort of see if you can find some star some goal, some direction, some way to go. And uh, you'll be able to answer this question, so what? So I'm going to. And then you fill in the blank. What's neat about it is nobody else can fill in your blank. But your blank is only left open by God for you to make good choices and to be sure you put it in. Uh, put into that blank something that's valuable. Please do that. I think God himself would say, do that. The days of your life are too precious to be wasted without a vision. Without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision, we perish. The other thing I like about this passage is it says, preach the word in good times and bad times. You know how you preach the word? By the way you live. You preach the word by the way you are. You preach the word by the way you look to God, by the way you look to people. You preach the word by the way you take care of yourself really curious because the best sermons that we ever see are the people that kind of live them out. Some folks would say, well, this passage was not written for us anyway. It was written for preachers. Timothy, after all, is a young preacher. Let me tell you who the ministers in the church of God are. Every single baptized man or woman. Every single one of us who have been named after the name of Jesus Christ and who bear the name Christian. Our last name is the same. Our family name is Christian. Each one of us are called to be ministers of Christ. And it says, preach the word in season. It says, rebuke. Now, a lot of preachers love to get into that rebuking business. Boy, I'll tell you what. 
uh, and rebuke that, you know, put down whatever sin it is that you're not committing and, uh, you know, sort of attack people. And I'm not saying there's not a place for us to hear the truth. Let me just present it to you. If you and I are doing something that's detrimental to our well-being and it's not good for us, in the name of God, cut it out. That goes for the preacher as well as the people. But the truth is that what we need is a little bit more motivation. It's not just to be put down. Last week, a guy that used to come to the church here is doing some preaching himself now and brought us for prayer meeting. Um, was that Sunday night or prayer meeting, Pat? What's that? Somebody help me. Sunday night. Sunday night. Uh, came to visit with us and brought us a little sheet. And it was about a friend of his that had been turned off the church and wouldn't go anywhere because every time he walked in the church, he got put down. And everybody got put down. And he said he wanted to go someplace where people got lifted up. And he ended up coming here. And incidentally, he died during the time that he was here. And we had that tremendous responsibility of being able to be present with him in the hour of his death and do the funeral. But it's an important thing that you represent something which is positive, something which is good. Did you notice how it says, if you're going to do it, be one that does it with encouragement? Our Sunday school class is studying the book of James. And we were talking today about if you break one little part of the law, you break all of the, the law. You already know the answer to that. You know, some people say, you mean if I just do one little thing that I'm guilty of all the rest? The answer to that is if any of us are in a position or place or a practice of doing something that separates us from God, of course, yes. Whatever it's a little thing or a big thing, you know. But it goes on and says, so be very careful about that kind of thing, but remember this. And these are the last three words uh, in chapter 2 of the book of James. Mercy triumphs over judgment. May God hasten the day when in the way you live and the way I live, our mercy is much, much larger than our sense of judgment. Justice is different. We work for justice. God works with us to work for justice for all human beings. But judgment is God's. And only one judge exists. There is no other. And that's the true and living God. So I love this particular passage. You know, uh, Preach the word in and out, good times, bad times. Everything you do, every time you do it, every way you do it, really does carry its own particular message. You are a sermon. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And I think most of us feel that kind of thing. And the last thing is if you start something, for heaven's sakes, finish it. That's what's, you know, so what? If you start it, finish it. If you make a New Year's resolution uh, in God's name and with God's help, finish it. Uh, I know a lot of us are great about starting a bunch of stuff and finishing some things. Um, one of the things I remember so very distinctly in our family life was when Anthony graduated from recovery. Uh, and he brought us, it's in my office if you ever like to see it, it's one of the little tokens you get when you finish the recovery program. And um, he brought it and he put it, in my, it, put it in my hand and he said, I finally finished something. And you know, a lot of us have these good ideas about the stuff we're going to do uh, or the stuff we need to do, but we don't act on it. And so if you start something, you need to learn the responsibility, the challenge, and the joy of finishing it. I think again of that story that we have told you and shared with you before because it's so relevant. And it really does illustrate the point about when Shell was a young girl, uh, we were doing a Wells Fest race and she came in late and she said she wasn't going to run because she started too late and she couldn't win. And I said, but you signed up to run. Incidentally, if you sign up for disciple, go. There's something about making a covenant and keeping a covenant and Wells folks need to do that. Um, you need to be shining examples of that. If you say, I'm going to go, then go. If you don't say, I'm going to go, then you don't have to go. Um, but that's the whole thing about growing. Anyway, so finally, with a lot of, uh, she wasn't very happy with her father type thing. I told her I'd go with her and run. And so we did, and nobody was there. She said, but there's nobody watching, Daddy. And I said, that's right. And she said, and there's nobody out. And I said, there's one person out. And um, she said, who? And I said, the referee. You know. And sure enough, the referee was at the end of the race for us. And a few people began to see us come in. And later in her life, she said to me, um, Dad, you know what? One of the changing points in my life was the day we finished the race. The scripture says, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. You and I are called in this brand new year to enter and to continue. I hope you will. We have a story that I always enjoy coming out of my uh, life and ancient past. Some of you have heard, some of you haven't, but it's such a good story, it always needs to be told again. Four o'clock in the morning, 
We're at a youth camp in Georgia. It's a spooky, cold night. Let me tell you what spooky is. It's when you have fog that comes four feet from the door of the dormitory where you're sleeping. I mean, you can go out and see this wall of fog, okay? That's how it is when we go to sleep. And about 4 o'clock in the morning, one of the guys that's the big hulk type, uh, or is it hunk, whatever it is these days. But anyway, he comes and he says, that, 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 a ghost, go, ghost, ghost out there. And I said, Ronnie, shut up. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. He said, there, there, there's a ghost out there. And he said, come on, come on. And I said, I'm not going to see any ghosts. It's cold. And he said, come on. So anyway, I got up and I went out and I'm looking out here and the night is... You ever felt a night like that, you know? And it's cold and, and the fog is right here and all of a sudden I hear... And all of a sudden this gray thing breaks out of the fog. About 12 feet tall, about 6 feet tall, uh, about 7 feet tall. And all of a sudden it disappears into the fog again. I mean, it's gray from head to foot. And so um, he said, see, see, see. And I said, oh. Yeah, yeah, no, no, nothing to it. And so I moved down the stairs. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to stop the ghost. He said, what? I said, I'm going to stop the ghost. How would you handle this? So anyway, I stood right there at the edge of the fog, and I heard the sound coming again. And when this thing broke through the fog, I said, stop. And it stopped. And I said, what are you doing? And a voice said, running. I said, what? <laughs> Gray sweatsuit, mask over his face, hood pulled up, pulled back the hood, lift up the mask, Leif Orell, the Swedish exchange student <laughs> that's in our church and visiting in Atlanta where we were together. And I said, Leif, it's four o'clock. It's five minutes after four. What are you doing? Running. I said, can't you run a little bit later in the day? No. Why? He said, because I am going to be the best runner on the Westminster High School track team. And in order to do that, you got to run early. So I'm running. I said, oh. And the gray thing disappeared again into the fog. But later, I had the privilege of going to the track meet where they carried Leif Arell off on their shoulders. He was the best runner on the team. You know what he got? You think of these beautiful trophies? You think of all this acclamation, he got a lot of applause. He got a crown of laurel leaves, exactly as that scripture says, fought a good fight, finished the course, kept the faith, and now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that's a crown of laurel leaves around the cross. So where your life and the life of God intersects, when people are, you yourself say, Christmas is over, the new year is coming, so what? In God's name, I pray that you will answer, so I'll begin again and live as I have not lived before. With God's help, you can do it. Amen.